welcome you to the California Accelerations webinar, uh, Acceleration Projects webinar on AB 1705 and Applied Calculus. Um, I'm Myra Snell, and I am the co-founder of the California Acceleration Project. We started in 2010 working on initiatives to improve English and math outcomes for California community college students. And I have been a member of the math faculty at Los Madonna's College for over 30 years. Um, the webinar today is going to be organized into three parts. We're going to spend about 20 minutes talking about AB 1705 and the findings of our most recent report. And then we are so lucky to have two faculty members with us who have been teaching applied calculus with co-requisite support in an open access um, course structure. Michelle Beattie from College of San Mateo and Seppi Darugia from Los Madonna's College. Michelle has been teaching face-to-face -face and Seppi has been doing an asynchronous version of the Applied Calc with Corex support. So we'll spend um, 20 minutes with each of them with a dive into their classrooms and their experiences. Um, we do have the chat open during the webinar. Um, we will be monitoring the chat for questions, but if we don't have time to answer your questions, we are going to stay on after four o'clock until about 4.30, and we can address any and all questions that have come through the chat that we haven't had a chance to uh, address during this first hour. The webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be posted on the California Acceleration Project's um, website, which you see there, accelerationproject.org. We will also early next week be posting the um, recording of the webinar and a folder of materials that will include the syllabi from Seppi and Michelle's classes in addition to some other materials that they're going to be sharing. Okay, without further ado, let's get talking about AB 1705. Let's see. All right, I'm going to start with cliff notes. Um, I'm going to be using a term called gateway math course, which is not actually a term in the law, but it's sort of a shorthand for a long phrase in the law that describes the first course within a student certificate degree or transfer program that satisfies program requirements. So I'm just gonna say gateway course when I mean the lowest level math course that satisfies the degree or transfer requirement within the student's program. So AB 1705 says that US high school graduates shall be directly placed into and when beginning math or quantitative reasoning enrolled in a gateway transfer level course. Let's see. Um, for all students, not just US high school graduates, placement and first math course enrollment must maximize the probability that the student will enter and complete the gateway transfer level math or quantitative reasoning course within a year of the initial attempt in the discipline. And there is an exception. So students can start in a transfer level prerequisite to the gateway course if colleges verify benefit to the student by showing two things. And these will look familiar because they were part of the earlier sister law, AB 705. Colleges who want to maintain a prerequisite would have to show that student, the student is highly unlikely to succeed in the gateway transfer level math course um, without the prerequisite and that the enrollment in the prerequisite to the gateway course improves the student's probability of completing the gateway transfer level math course within a one year time frame. On the left there, I have cited the actual sections of the law that I'm referring to. So if you want to look up those sections later, you can read all the legalese. All right, what if a, pre a prerequisite is not validated? Uh, the answer is the same for pre-transfer level or transfer level prerequisites. Um, the college cannot require or recommend the prerequisite course if it's not validated. And US high school graduates must begin in the gateway transfer level course. So what does AB 1705 mean for the business major? If you look at the transfer model curricula, which is part of our CID system, our um, common course numbering system, 
The transfer model curricula for the Associate of Science for Transfer in Business requires statistics and then gives the students a choice between calcul business calculus, applied calculus, or finite math. So these would be the gateway courses for that associate degree. Uh, Pre-calculus and college algebra do not satisfy a requirement for the AST in business. So therefore, if these courses are prerequisites to those gateway courses, the college must validate standard uh, validate uh, benefit to the students based on the AB 1705 standards we just discussed. And the validation deadline for non-STEM programs is July 1st of this year, and changes to curricula if required would have to take place the following year uh, by July 1st of 2024. So here's the name of our report. Um, if you haven't read it, it is posted under our um, publications tab on our website. And what we are doing in this report is examining how prerequisites, co-requisite options, and the discontinuation of remedial math, intermediate algebra and below, uh, how those things are working to impact equitable access to and completion of calculus for the business major. And here are the findings from our report. Access to business calculus is inconsistent across colleges. We're a large system and there's a lot of vari variability. Uh, Co-requisites are better than prerequisites at improving business calculus completion for students who are deemed not calculus ready. Colleges serving a large share of the state's black or Hispanic students are more likely to restrict access to business calculus and less likely to offer a co-requisite. And finally, access to business calculus varies, wide, varies widely within and across regions in the state. I guess I should stop to say a lot of courses that I am calling business calculus are actually called applied calculus. So they are targeted to business and life sciences. But as I've talked with faculty across the state, it seems like mostly business majors are enrolled in these courses. All right, before we get diving into what's happening across the state, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background. Um, we looked at the 2022-2023 catalogs and the fall 2022 class schedules. And so all the information you're gonna be seeing in the PowerPoint is based on those sources. We found that 92 colleges out of the 115 offer business calculus as an option for meeting the math requirements of an associate degree for transfer in business. Again, they might be called applied calculus. Um, at all 92 colleges, we found that the applied calculus or business calculus course is certified by CID as a Math 140 course, which means that these courses have the same learning goals and the same content. And this certification requires an intermediate algebra prerequisite to the course, but it also lists a college algebra course as an advisory. All right, so here's our first finding. Access to business calculus is inconsistent across colleges. Uh, what you see on the left called access for all with a co-requisite means that there were 25 colleges in the state that as of fall were offering a business calc or applied calc course with a co-requisite and allowing all students to have direct access, therefore, to the business calculus course by taking it with a co-rec. Uh, the 14 represents 14 colleges that I'm still calling access for all. They do not offer a co-requisite, but they have an intermediate algebra prerequisite they no longer offer the intermediate algebra course at the college. So they clear that prerequisite through the multiple measures placement process and all students at that college would have access to business calculus, even though there's no co-requisite. The nine represents nine colleges who also have an intermediate algebra prerequisite, but they don't offer a co-rec and they still offered intermediate algebra as of fall 2022. So I was assuming that probably those students are having to go through an intermediate algebra course before taking the business calculus. And then the tall bar of 44 colleges are colleges that have a transfer level prerequisite to their business calc course. It could be college algebra or pre-calculus. Those were um, what most colleges tended to have who were in this group. Um, and that would be above the requirements for a CID certification. 
All right. I wanted to pause for a moment and just think about why colleges want to bar access to business calculus. Like, what are our beliefs behind that kind of a policy? And I think that a lot of math faculty feel in the community college system in California, but also at the university level, that students just aren't ready for calculus. Um, they There is an equity argument that's often made that prerequisites keep the door open to math intensive careers for students who are deemed underprepared. So there's sort of a ladder into right uh, calculus for students that are viewed as uh, not calculus ready. There's also, I think, a learning progression argument that's often made. You know, if you don't know A, you can't possibly learn B. So you will hear faculty say, how could I possibly teach the derivative to students who don't know how to factor a polynomial? Okay. And then I think there is what I would call a fear argument, <laughs> um, which is that prerequisites are there to protect students who aren't deemed ca um, calculus ready. We want to protect them from failing calculus and by diverting them into a course in which they could be successful, right, and build their skills. I then want to ask the question, we have these beliefs that I think are baked into our system through prerequisites and ask the question, are these views supported by data? And I turned to answer that question to a large statewide study um, that was done by the RP group. Terrence Willett was the author of this one, of students who were transitioning from California high schools into California community colleges after AB 705. And what I did is I dug into the data of that report and pulled out information on students who did not take or did not pass a course above Algebra II or the equivalent when they were in high school. Now, other studies by the RP group show that students that are in this category, they either never got to Algebra II or they passed it and didn't go past that course. These students tend to have lower pass rates in their first community college math course. So these would be students that we would probably be worried about, right? The underprepared group, the group that we um, are designing prerequisites to help them, or at least that's the argument. So these students, when they come to the community college, they enroll in a, in a variety of levels of math and types of math because there's a lot of variability across the state in our uh, prerequisite policies. Um, so I'm going to just have you think about for a moment, if these students, students who had not taken or had not passed a course above Algebra II, um, where do you think they have the highest pass rate? If they start in pre-calculus, if they start in calculus, or they start in statistics? Okay, so I'm going to bet that you guessed the highest pass rate was in statistics. Is that true? <laughs> that that might be the course that has maybe less algebra than the other courses. So maybe if students who were in this group went right into statistics, they would have the highest pass rate. But we also know that students with this level of preparation tend to have lower pass rates overall. So statistics was the highest pass rate with 42%. All right, what do you think was the next highest? Pre-calculus? Calculus? Let's just look at pre-calc. Students who went direct this, uh, from this group who went directly into, started in pre-calculus or college algebra, was a very large group of students and 38% of them passed. But students who took some form of calculus as their first community college math course, and they were in this group where they had not completed anything above algebra two, 41% of them passed. So what this said to me is that students with really similar levels of preparation pass these three very different courses at roughly the same rates. So traditional views of readiness don't explain these results and call into question the efficacy of putting students into a pre-calculus or college algebra prerequisite when they had a, a little higher pass rate if you let them directly into calculus. All right. Let's go to the second finding in the report, which is about co-requisites. Co-requisites, at least in the first little bit of data I had access do, to, were doing better than prerequisites at improving calculus completion for this group of students who were deemed not calculus ready. 
So in fall of 2019, and this came from the basic skills cohort tracker, uh, the first eight colleges offered a co-requisite with applied calculus that was open access. And of the students across those colleges enrolled in that um, linkage of applied calculus with a co-rec, 57% of them passed the calculus course. If you compared that to pre-reform at those same eight colleges where those students would have been starting in intermediate algebra, only 16% of the students starting in intermediate algebra completed the applied calculus course within a year. So co-requisites at these first eight colleges are producing much better outcomes for students than their old uh, paradigm of having students start in intermediate algebra. Now, if you compare these results to a statewide study that was done by the Public Policy Institute of California, they found that 15% of business and STEM students who began in college algebra um, completed some form of calculus after three semesters, compared to 64% of students starting directly in applied calculus. I'm always surprised at how similar these numbers are, whether you're looking at eight colleges or you're looking at the whole state, that when you have a prerequisite, you tend to have a predictable level of attrition, right? So I want to investigate that for a moment next. Um, attrition is inevitable whenever you've got a prerequisite sequence, right? You got to pass the prerequisite course, choose to enroll in the gateway course, and then pass that course. So for example, we know from PPIC studies that 40% of students who take college algebra pass it statewide. And then the rest of this is hypothetical. Let's assume that 60% of those students persisted into calculus and 65% passed calculus. If you think about the multiplicative effect of these pipelines, that would mean that only 16% of the original cohort taking college algebra completed calculus. Right. So anytime you have a prerequisite structure, you have this inevitable attrition that is built in. But you also find when you look at these pipeline studies that students who pass the prerequisite. So these are students who are capable students. They often choose not to persist into calculus. And I found, and, and these were studies that have now been cited in the Mathematical Association of America studies and discussion of calculus and the just equations reports on calculus, that if you look at university studies, um, we see that after taking pre-calculus and being successful, a very large percentage of students choose not to enroll in calculus. So, for example, at Texas Tech, a third of their students who had earned a B or better in pre-calc did not enroll in calculus. And at Arizona State University, 65% of the declared life science majors who earned a C or better in pre-calculus did not persist. And 55% of physical science majors and 38% of declared engineer majors, majors did not persist after demonstrating that they were capable by passing the pre-calculus course. So I think what we're seeing here is that we actually have a model where not only is attrition built into the model, but there is a discouragement with even capable students who demonstrate their capacity by passing the prerequisite course, choosing to change their major and not persist into calculus. Now, when you look at a calculus correct model, I think that there is something about that model that welcomes students into the business major. So you have a course that's taught in the context of applica business applications. It counts toward their business degree. There's no stigma in needing help with algebra because the algebra remediation is just intentionally integrated into the course. And there's more instructional time for individualized help. Now, I think if you compare that to the college algebra or pre-calculus prerequisite from the student's perspective, the student is being sidelined into a decontextualized math course where the application to business is unclear, right? It's taught often by math people like me, <laughs> very generalized, right? Not applied. And the course does not count toward requirements for the business degree. So these kinds of things 
may explain why students not only disengage in the course, uh, it may not pass the prerequisite course, but it also might explain why even if they do pass the prerequisite course, they disengage from the major altogether and change their majors. All right, now we're gonna to move to the third finding, which is looking at this variety of levels of access to business calculus across the state. And what we found is that colleges that serve a large share of the state's black or Hispanic students are more likely to restrict access to business calculus and they're less likely to act, uh, offer a co-requisite support, which is very effective in helping students complete the course. So if you look at in the first on the left, um, colleges, there were 20 colleges that fit our uh, classification of large serving a large share of the state's black students. This is serving, this would mean that more than 1.5% of black students in the state attend that college. It adds up to about a little over nearly 1900 black students at the college. And if you look at colleges like that, 15% of them have a co-rec. If you compare that to colleges that have a large share of Hispanic students, these are colleges that serve uh, one and a quarter percent of the state's uh, Hispanic student population, which I think averages out to just under 13,000 Hispanic students. You can see that only 14% of colleges in that category offered a co-rec compared to 31% of other colleges. So half as likely to offer the effective co-rec than, student, than colleges that were not serving a large share of the state's Black or Hispanic students. If you look at the other end, the high transfer level prereq that's not required by CID certification, you can see that colleges that serve a large share of Black students or a large share of Hispanic students are much more likely right, to have that higher level bar for students to have to jump over before they have access to calculus. And as we just talked about, if you've got a high level bar or you've got a prerequisite, you are gonna bleed students out. They're never gonna to get to calculus. And often we see that they change their major. All right, last finding we have from our report is that there's a lot of variability across the state by region. So if you look, for example, at South Central region, there's seven of the eight colleges there at the top of that graph that offer business calculus. Two of those allow everyone access to it and the other five have the highest bar. So you can see across the state, if a student attends their local community college, um, there's a large variability in whether or not they'll have access to uh, business calculus. Okay, so I'll end by just saying we had some recommendations coming out of this report, and I think they're probably obvious. Um, we recommend replacing prerequisites with co-requisite support that's tailored to the business degree. Um, and following the principles of good co-requisite design, which is based on some of the work at the Dana Center, which you can see in the report. Uh, we in, um, recommend, and we'll hear more today when we hear from Michelle and Seppi, of integrating instructional strategies into the Gateway course that create welcoming, intellectually engaging, and interactive and supportive learning environments. And this last one is to consider starting the business student with statistics, which might be a uh, easier um, uh, introduction into college level mathematics. And so having them do their statistics first and then transitioning into a business calculus course with a uh, co-requisite. All right, with that, I'm going to hand things over to Michelle um, from College of San Mateo, who will tell us about her open access uh, applied calculus course with support. There, I found the mute button. Hello, um, I'm Michelle Beatty. I'm from the College of San Mateo math faculty there. And, and um, let me see if I can get my screen shared properly here. And let's see, pushing buttons here, it didn't do it. There we go, I think I've got it. Um, so I am teaching um, the Applied Calculus with support here at the College of San Mateo. I've been teaching it for about a year and a half. Um, CSM offers both the Applied Calculus, that's our usual five-unit course, and the Applied Calculus with support class, uh, which is five units plus one unit for the co-requisite, and that's open for everyone to take it. 
Um, and I wanted to start with uh, just telling you a little bit of my story, just to kind of give you my perspective. Um, I took some time off to be a stay at home mom. I took about 15 years off from teaching. And when I came back after 15 years, as you can imagine, everything's different. And so I had to change things. I had to change the way that I taught. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time learning how to teach with this active learning style. And what was super helpful to me was that we had a community of practice at Kenyatta College where I started off with, again, uh, my restart, you could say, um, as an adjunct. And when I came in uh, for my interview, they said, well, can you teach statistics? And I said, I've never, I've never taught, I've never even taken a statistics class. So they said, that's, that's okay. Come to our community of practice. We'll help you. And it was focused on this one course. And we together went through lesson plans. We went into all the little gory details and we focused a lot on active learning. And then um, fast forward to now I'm at College of San Mateo working full time here. And we also do a, lot, a community of practice and a lot of sharing. And the community practice here um, meets every other week, and we are a big group. We um, don't focus on one course in particular, but we're very student-centered. We um, talk a lot about what happens in our co-requisite courses, and a lot of the conversation is what works, what didn't work, I've got this problem, what do you suggest, that kind of thing. Um, so. Uh, my goal is to give you a, a window into what things look like in my course and in my classroom. This is a picture I took of my class yesterday. And um, this is an amazing room. I feel so fortunate that I get to use this sometimes. I don't always get my class in this room. And when it happens that I'm in just a regular classroom, I, you know, it works. It's fine. But this room is awesome. Um, it took a lot of hard work and money to get that to happen um, but you can see it's very set up very well for group work so um, anyway i wanted to show off my room a little bit how i usually start my day in my classroom is with a welcome of some kind and it's usually very short things like how are you doing what's going on or is something going wrong whoops i forgot to post something on canvas let me fix that you know, um, short conversation to just make them feel welcome, make them feel like I'm there as an ally, someone to help them and um, you know, try to build a comfort level. Um, my, I know I shouldn't have my lectures be more than 30 minutes. I really try not to have them more than 30 minutes. And this is in a, a one hour, 50 minute class period, but that's nearly impossible to get all the the content I feel needs to be delivered and the way that I want to deliver it. So I make sure that I'm breaking things up. Um, and I have a few little tricks for how I break up the lecture. Uh, one of them is a Plickers question, and, and I have a short little thing on what that is. Um, and you all know the, the think, pair, share. Um, so usually I want to give multiple examples. Well, now I tend to give one example, and then the next one is you try it and talk to each other. And so I'm really trying to foster um, a community. You have each other, talk to each other, um, try it yourself, think about it, but then pair up with somebody. What did they do? Maybe, maybe talk to other people at other tables too. Um, and in classes that need more effective domain, I might just break up a, a lecture with a story something that um, has a moral to it, some kind of intent that I think they need. I have found in the business calculus classes, though, I have not really needed as much of that because they're serious students, I'm finding. I'm finding that they do the homework. They do not just do the homework. They go back and do the similar questions and try and try and try again. Um, so. I find that I don't need as much of the effective domain in this group, uh, but when I do see that there's some kind of need of, okay, I've got some study skills or student skills missing here, I'll try to, to have some things within the class to address that. 
Uh, but the most important thing, I think, is the group work, some kind of activity that I would like for it to be about 30 to 45 minutes. Sometimes I just don't have quite that much time, but I usually have at least 30 minutes. Sometimes I plan for 30 minutes and then I let it go to 45 minutes or so just because I can see the benefit. I can see how it's really helping the students. Um, so they've mentioned flickers, and this is just a snapshot of uh, me running the flickers in my class. You may have heard of clickers where you have a multiple choice question, and this is a free version of that. So I uh, print out cards and then they orient their card um, to give the answer that they want. And each card has a symbol that's unique to that student. So then I take my cell phone and scan the room and the students all think that's really cool because there I am with my cell phone and pretty fast, boom, 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 all these uh, people's answers are getting recorded. And I find this extremely helpful in the beginning of the semester when I'm trying to learn people's names. Um, as I'm scanning with my cell phone, um, I see their faces, this is my camera, and I also see their name pop up either in red or green, depending on if they're answering correctly. So it gives me a quick view of how they're doing, um, a quick view of names and faces to match up. Um, so Flickers, Flickers is something I really like and I think they really enjoy too. Um, and then I really wanted to talk about group work. Um, so why I do group work, um, I really feel like you need that kind of active learning rather than watching my students nodding off as I'm lecturing on and on um, and getting them active within the lecture, um, you know, takes some take some like letting them know that I want them to be asking questions. I want them to be active. And I think the group work really sets that up. Um, day one, I have a group work. Even if I'm not able to get a lot of content in, I'm sure to have a group work because I want to establish this is how the class runs. This is what is going to happen. Um, so the work first day worksheet might be something really basic. Um, I have one that's like ordered pairs, just something very basic. And it's designed in a way that they have to talk to each other. It's not just answer the question. They, they have to like write out in words what it means so that I'm trying to, so they can see that they are supposed to talk to each other. Um, and I give only one worksheet out per group so that they have to work together too. So I try to establish some of that right in the beginning that what the expectations are, um, that I want them to talk, that I want them to ask questions. And um, so how I do that, um, usually I have a worksheet. Uh, you can see there's a lot of whiteboards in this particular classroom, so whiteboards could be used. But um, the reason I like the worksheet is because at the end of the class period, I have them turn in a worksheet per table. It gives me something like about 10 worksheets to look at. And I go through at the end of class, after class, and I, uh, I make some comments and I see where the weaknesses are so I can get regular feedback to them rather than waiting till a test comes to find out they didn't know this. So um, the regular feedback uh, for me, so I know where they're at. And then the very next class during group work time, I go around to the groups. They usually sit together in the same group but not always, and then I'll carry a paper from one table to another. Um, and, I, and I show them, oh, uh, you know, on this problem here, I see that, we've, that there's a misunderstanding, so let's make sure you've got this. And it gives me a chance to talk with them. Um, not, you know, some of it is kind of one-on-one, -on -one, and some of it is like me and two students at a time, but it gives me a chance to talk to them and get to know them. And I really want them to be able to approach me. I want to be approachable. I want them to know that that I'm, uh, you know, I'm there for them. And I think that being able to actually take this group work time and uh, talk with them and get to know them is is very critical. Um, and I, I wanted to point out this picture. Uh, I took these pictures yesterday, and I was trying to get a picture of my tutor in the background here. 
And I ended up getting a very common scene in my group work time in the front. And I think this actually turned out far better because it shows what my group work looks like without the tutors. They're still helping each other out. They're working together and every table is doing this. Um, and that, you know, it didn't take too much with this group because these are calculus students. They're pretty serious. It's applied calculus students. And I, and I find that they work hard. They want to, to do this. They are, um, they have fairly decent study skills in this group. Um, and so this group in the front here is interesting because they have um, a mix. There's a couple of, they're kind of actually all different levels. There's one very weak student and one kind of medium uh, right here, these two. And you can see them helping each other out. And I love that the, uh, the kind of in the middle, not super strong, but can do it. Um, is the one kind of leading the weaker student. And yet they also at the table have a very strong student that sits across from them. So that was a lucky mix. And, and uh, you know, I have all kinds like this group over here, they're, they're like laid back and kind of crack a lot of jokes and they could do well together. They, um, they, you know, fit together and they feel comfortable together coming to class. And then I have a group that's like, really really detail oriented you know show show me why that's true not just show me how to do it and they all feel the same way so the students are kind of gravitating towards the type of student that they want to be matched up with during group work time and so i have some group work challenges and uh, one of them is you know how do you get students to do productive work and uh, and so I've kind of already addressed these first things. I try to set expectations, try to build some community, try to help them feel comfortable. Um, and that comfort, I think, also to help them feel that comfort, letting them pick their own groups, even though you end up with, you know, a variety of things happening with different levels and, um, you know, some of them all the same level and maybe they're all the same level and not very strong um, but then i know i need to check in with that group a little bit more often and um, sometimes there are groups that work so so much more slowly that they don't finish the classwork and i have a policy that as long as you're working the entire period and seriously working you will get full credit on that classwork so I have my class works out of three points and I almost always give three out of three because they're all working, but occasionally there's somebody who wasn't and might lose a point. Um, but for the most part, I don't even have to mention that they are all working hard. This is a sample worksheet. One of my class works, this is early in the semester. Um, this one I think was still week one. But what I did in this particular worksheet was I had a business application and um, there's a lot of algebra within it. So we get the contextualized algebra um, and we get some of the new concepts together with the algebra. And so you can see some of the student learning outcomes that are within it, even though I don't have the entire worksheet on here, I just have a little snippet of it. Um, and you can kind of see some of the basic questions that we start with here of, you know, can you put in the X to the function? You know, some of them don't recognize that that's what they're supposed to do. And so, so it's trying to address some of those um, weaker, weaker, I don't know if you even call them algebra skills, just missing, missing pieces, gaps in their knowledge, I guess I should say, um, as at the same time as moving forward with the current topics. Um, so I have a bunch of different classworks that I have given um, that I put into a folder that I believe you'll have access to at the end of this um, webinar. And just if you want to see the kinds of things that I'm doing, um, I think I put about 10 different sample worksheets in there that I gave to my class this semester and or the semester before. I think I put some from later on in the in the semester too. <clears throat> um, and then I do have embedded tutors. I'm very fortunate right now that I have two embedded student tutors in my class. 
and they are awesome. They are like gold. These are the the best things to having embedded tutors in the class is one of the best tools. Um, I can do the group work without them. It's true. I have had to certainly there are days when when I'm on my own, but when they're there, it allows um, it gives the students so much more support. But it's even more than that. It's um, their their peers, and I think that a lot of students feel more comfortable going to a peer and saying, "I don't understand this." Then you know maybe maybe it catches a few more of those. Um, of those I don't understand this that they might not otherwise do. Um, just more hands for one, um, but also that they're peers. And so some of the jobs that the embedded tutors have done is they have um, helped out during group work, think pair share times, other appropriate times during the class. They hold study sessions. They um, model what it's like to be a, a good student. Um, and then one of the biggest things I do with that extra one hour per week of time that I have for the co-requisite is just to slow things down and put in those extra steps. We might have said, well, and then you do the algebra for this and off you go, um, but I'll slow down and do the algebra and show them how to distribute or whatever it was that they probably would have had from algebra. Um, so we do tuck the algebra within um, the calculus problems. And here's an example of one. We we're doing the difference quotient, and I was taking the time to distribute everything out. And then I said, and if this was difficult for you, please come to my algebra workshop. And this is a picture of some um, algebra workshop time in the Math Resource Center. And if you don't have an algebra workshop to offer, you can say, come to my office hours, come to this student resource, I like to point out all the student resources on campus as I go to. I give my students a lot of materials. This is a little snapshot of my Canvas page under the modules. I give them lecture slides, the classwork, and then before an exam, I'll give them uh, practice tests and solutions so they can see all the problems put together rather than here's the problem from this chapter. Um, the last things I want to put in here are uh, just that, you know, integrating the algebra within the lecture, but also integrating the algebra within the homework is something that I do. Um, one of the really nice things that the CSM math faculty had set up before I even came over here was that they had a canvas shell with shared materials per class and more. Um, and in our CSM community of practice, one of the most common statements that's made over and over again is know your students. And that way we can, you know, address what their needs are. And the best way to know your students, of course, is to be talking with them. And during group work time is my favorite time to do that. And I think that's, yep, yeah, that was my last slide. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, we didn't have any questions directed uh, exactly to what you presented, so I think we're going to move on to Seppi's presentation. Um, and Michelle will be here for a, a few minutes um, after four o'clock, but then she does have to teach, so um, we can send any additional questions to her directly. Thank you, Seppi. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sepide, and I'm teaching at Los Madonna's College. And thank you so much for giving me the time to go over my class materials. So, uh, a little bit of history about uh, applied calculus in our class uh, in our college. Uh, applied calculus is van Math 140, which is the standalone applied calc, and it is four units. We have two hours of lab for this class. It has a prerequisite. And then we also have the applied calculus with support. We have been offering it since fall 2019. And uh, it has two hours of lab for the standalone part. And we also added one hour of in-class lab uh, to the support part last year. And it is open access. And uh, before continuing with the rest, if you think about, if you think the thought of teaching calculus to students with no background in algebra is very 
scary or it is hard, let's just take a moment that you are teaching them applied calculus. And here is just the, some of the learning goal that we have in this class. We are working with a lot of application related to their major, which makes it very interesting for them. And it is easier for them to connect because we have a lot of application in this class. So a little bit about the success rate at LMC. Um, so 188 students took applied calculus between fall 21 and fall 22, and 47% of them took it with support, the open access one. And then passing rate, as you can see, it is very similar between the standalone applied calc and the applied calc with prerequisite support. So I have been teaching this class asynchronous uh, because I started during the pandemic and then as a department, we decided that it is really beneficial for our students because they have access to all the material all the time. And uh, personally, it is easier for me to keep a student in this format rather than before the pandemic that I was losing a lot of a student. The student in taking this class or a special group of a student, they have a lot of life going on out there. So this way, I feel like they always have access to the material of the class. So one of the suggestions that I have before I start, I'm not an expert. I'm just here to share my experience teaching this class with you guys. So uh, I'm just here to share. Uh, one of the suggestions that I have here is have a routine for the class. So you having the same format every week help the class uh, know what they expect. And since they're very busy people, like they have family, they have, they're working full time, they have a lot of responsibility. They know how to, how to manage their time around the assignment. And I have a lot of students, they submit like late at night work. So having the same format and routine for them every week, helping them to adjust their time. So here is a screenshot of one of my sections on Canvas. So they know they always have some reading material, some general videos that they can go over. Then they have my focused lecture videos and handout. And then it's followed by a couple of activities. So I always give them a your turn activity, which is basically a question with a guided video and all they needed to solve it, check their answer with me, and then submit it on Canvas. The grade is based on completion for that because I already have the answer for them. We always have some sort of discussion board because especially in the, this class, they struggle a lot with interpretation and explaining their answer. So the discussion boards are a great way for them to uh, express their answer, try to interpret in full sentence and learn from each other. I pick homework assignments for this class from my open math, and I normally give them 100 attempts. Basically, I use homeworks for mastery of skills. I added algebra question to that. I added like other type of calculus question to that too. But this is more for practice, practice until you get the final answer. Normally, this question have a guided video, and they are able to just meet with me over office hours or send me a screenshot of their work, and I provide feedback for them. And then since we have lab hours part of our class, lab assignments are normally more in-depth question that they need to show their work, explain their reasoning, graph using Desmos and submit on Canvas. I provide individual feedback for this assignment. One of the suggestions is to start slow in this class. Why is starting is slow is the right speed? It allows the student to build confidence in this class. They come with a history of, okay, I either I'm not good at algebra or math, or I have taken this class so many years ago, or I never took an any algebra related class. So it gives you and your students some time to build confidence while they are getting to the used to the expectation that always show your work, express your reasoning for the class. For example, the first chapter that I have to cover in this class is uh, function and change. And this is the best time to actually add some algebra review to this class. I know you feel like we have a lot of hard materials later that I have that we have to cover, but uh, by my experience is you're gonna save a lot of time later because with the easier topic, you actually added a lot of practice of algebra and make sure that they show all their steps and explain their reasoning. And with my experience, never skip any 
a step for this for this class. Even at the end of the semester, always show all this step. One of the other suggestions that I have is try to not separate algebra from the calculus content. For example, try to not teach algebra and then try to teach calculus content. For example, this is an example of one of my discussion words. I assign this discussion word at the end of the uh, section for taking the shortcut to derivatives. And I know that after that section, I need to cover the critical, like basically relative extreme all that. We need a lot of factoring. So this question I'm asking them, oh, can you help one of my students that she's taking the derivative, this student takes the derivative, but her final answer is not matching the answer key to the, like the answer key in the book. So basically they need to practice, like take the derivative, explain the reasoning for the derivative, and then also find out why the answer is not matching the answer key. Basically, they need to simplify the final answer. So at this point, we are just practicing the derivatives. At the same time, we are practicing factory. And some of them are doing a great job. I know a lot of them are asking help before posting their answer, which is fine. But at the end, they are able to answer it and explain it in their own words. One of the other things that I have been trying in my class, and I feel like it is really helpful and helping them establish some sort of a study habit is review discussion words. So they need to review, review, review. I personally need to review, review, review in order to learn something. And I feel like sometimes they don't know that. And especially with asynchronous class and I'm not there to reminding them, uh, these type of discussion boards are really helpful. For example, I asked them at the end of the chapter one, explain in your own words what you learned about linear function, exponen exponential function, and find a real life application. I feel like this finding real life application is making the class more interesting because they feel like this is not something they are never going to use. And the response that I get are very nice. Like they actually spend some time finding a good application related to the materials that we learn. So I have been finding these type of like discussion words very helpful. This is a sample of discussion board that I just was grading last week. And um, it's very long, so you don't need to go over all of it. But I give you guys a couple of seconds if you want to take a look at the response that I got from my students. And my experience in this class, and one of the aspects that I really enjoy teaching this class is focus on application. Real life examples are the key point to this class that make it very interesting for them. And they are actually doing much better than just working on a bunch of mathematical equations which is more interesting to honestly. And then uh, group project is a real, place, really good place to do that. But especially since I'm teaching asynchronous, it's very challenging to offer group project in an asynchronous class. I got the idea of this type of uh, group project from one of my awesome colleagues, Julie Van Borgen, she's actually here. Uh, but uh, keep it simple. But I don't suggest more than two or three during the semester because there are a lot of work. And if you're offering your class asynchronous, uh, it's very hard to ask them to meet outside of uh, the class, like with different schedule, work, family to meet and set up a time to work on a Zoom meeting. But uh, what we are, what I'm doing in the class is they have a discussion board to post their contact information, a good time to meet. And then they're setting up a time uh, to meet out like with their schedule and work on the project. They can get help or feedback from me or our math lab, which is the math tutoring center that we have. They normally get a couple of topics and I want them to explain all the work basically. I also assign some mini projects as part of my exams, uh, which I will go over uh, later in this presentation. So I give two exam and final one final exam in this class and the, what I get for the exams 
or I have a true false portion of the exam, which is more uh, in depth based on concept and they need to explain the reasoning for me. So I'm not just accepting a bunch of calculation. I always want them to show me your reasoning, explain to me what you got these numbers, especially the class is asynchronous. And we know that it is easy to just copy from somewhere. So the more I have these type of question, I help with that cheating part of the online classes. I have a written analysis that involves calculation using technology. I'm using Desmos in my class, so they need to check their answer using Desmos, uh, copy and paste their graph straight from Desmos there. And I assign these mini project as part of the exams. So this is a sample of uh, the mini project that I have for uh, my final exam. And uh, one of the CSLOs is like, they're able to read the publication, write a summary, connect it to the materials. And uh, they're actually doing a really good job at the end of the semester, write something, uh, express their understanding of the topic and connect it with what we'll have learned throughout the semester. And uh, one of the other things that to me is more important than just the support with algebra is helping them beyond the algebra. One of the key point is be flexible with them with the due dates, uh, because I feel like they have a lot going on and uh, being flexible, helping them to catch up with the class. Let be flexible, but let not let them fall behind. I always have a Friday check-ins that every Friday I go over my grade book, see who missed any assignment. And I send them an email reminding them, offering them extra help. This way I keep a lot of a student. I have a good completion rate. Like I'm able to keep a lot of a student till the end of the class. Uh, so I feel like this is very helpful for them. Offer revision if possible. I know revision is a lot of work, but uh, if you can offer revision, I offer revision in my lab assignment. And I feel like I used to spend hours writing feedback for my student and they were making the same mistake in exam. But now that I offer them revision in lab assignment and I normally pick a time, okay, by this date, please revise and resubmit if you want. And they actually read my feedback, redo their work and submit it back on Canvas. It is a little bit of extra time, like spending for me time grading, like regrading, but uh, it is really helpful. And they have been taking advantage of this opportunity to improving their grade. And then one of the last thing, at least in an asynchronous class is uh, if you can offer one-on-one -on -one help to a struggling student. Every semester I have maybe very few students that they really struggle in this class. And office hours, I normally have a lot of students and you, especially during the project and I also teach stats. So I get a lot of students in my office hours. It's very hard to just spend a lot of time with a struggling student. But if you can, a schedule one-on-one -on -one help outside of that office hours uh, is very helpful to keep those students and help them in the class. And then a very final note, uh, note is that I really want to encourage you guys to teach this, like offer this class. I know this is a challenging class, but yet it's a very rewarding class. You see that the student comes with very, like with a low self-confidence of teaching math. Like I mean, learning math, being in a math classroom, but at the end, they're surprised of themselves, like how they can do great in this class. So Maya wanted me to share one of these uh, student feedback. So uh, I had this student, I think it's spring 21, and uh, he sent me a message at the end of the semester that it has been a while since I have taken a math class. And I was surprised at how easily I was able to learn the material. They're very hardworking student. That's a very interesting class. So I highly encourage you guys to offer this course. And uh, here is my contact info if you guys need any help. If you wanna teach this class for the first time, feel free to send me an email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seppi. Um, I want to say, Michelle, before you jump off, there was one question that got posted um, 
wanting to know whether or not you used my open math. I think Seppi said she does use that. And, and there was a question whether or not you did. Uh, no, currently right now, um, CSM has a book that we have to use because we do have a, a second semester um, course. And so we need them to match with the textbooks. Um, I don't want to try to guess the, the author's name. I'm sorry. I don't have that off the top of my head. It's a Pearson um, published book, though. But I do use Desmos um, rather than have them buy a graphing calculator, use the free graphing calculator Desmos. OK, so it is 4 o'clock. And we will, um, I know Michelle needs to jump off to class, but I think Seppi is able to stay on a little longer. Um, and we do have a lot of questions. I wanted to say thank you to Terrence Willett for jumping in on some of the more technical questions. Um, I also wanted to say that there were some questions that I think we need to leave to, uh, the Chancellor's Office is putting out a, a further implementation guidance on AB 1705. So questions about whether or not uh, we can, you know, what we can do with non-credit and things like that. I think I'm going, I don't want to speak for the chancellor's office. So I think um, we need to wait until we get their guidance. I also understood um, that they have a, they had over a thousand people come to their February 7th webinar and they had hundreds of questions submitted. And I do understand that there is a very lengthy FAQ that's going to also be released to the field that will have some of your more technical questions um, hopefully answered. Um, if you do have technical questions like that, um, you can also uh, email the Chancellor's Office directly um, at, um, and I think I need to, I want to verify this, that they have a, a specific email address. Summer, do you know that email address? I don't, I'm sorry. Okay, let me look it up real quick um, before we move on to some of the other questions. And I am a terrible multitasker, but we'll see. Anyway, I'll put that in the chat when I find it. Um, I also noticed that we have a few people who have, um, Valerie, hello, Valerie. I don't know if you're still here, um, that have posted here. Um, that's it, David, thank you ab705 at cccco.edu. Thank you. Thank you, David. So that is a direct line to the Chancellor's Office with questions that you have around the, the nuances of um, AB1705 no, guidance. Um, I wanted to say that we do occasionally, and we did on this webinar, have math faculty who I think are struggling not only with the new mandates, but with their own experiences with co-requisites. And it always makes me sad um, to hear that they're having a bad experience with something that other colleges are having so much success with. So I wanted to offer two thoughts here. Um, one is that when faculty say, how can we possibly cover all of this prerequisite material in the, and, and also cover the calculus, right? I think what you hear from these two women that we just heard, these two math faculty people that we just heard present, is that they are designing backwards. They are looking at the calculus content and saying, what does the student need to know today to be able to do this? And then they are making sure that there is intentional instruction built into their, and Michelle described into her actual demonstrations in class, Seppi described it as part of the little videos that students look at and part of the practice opportunities that they have where they have infinite number, 100 is it? That's not infinite, 100, 100 practice opportunities. They can keep doing something until they feel comfortable with it. So I think what is important in co-requisite design, and I did put a link in the report to the Dana Center's um, design principles around good co-requisites. They are you know, working nationally with states on co-requisite design. But this idea of backwards design and really thinking about what you need and when is fundamentally important. And I think it also, when I talked with Seppi and Michelle, their sense is that it motivates students to learn. 
right? Some of the algebra that they might be less interested in if we were teaching it in an intermediate algebra course. So that's one thing as I think that there are principles around co-requisite design. And as we begin to learn to do this better and better, um, I'm hearing the same things. It's about backwards design. It's about contextualizing the skills within something that the students are having to learn um, th this higher level. I also want to say that we have to be careful about our mindsets with these mandates. That if we enter into our design work or enter into our interactions with students with a sense that they're gonna fail, this isn't gonna work, right? This is a disaster, that you will have a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I'm not just saying that from my own belief system, there is actually research done with STEM faculty that shows that their mindset about their students' abilities and their students' ability to grow and learn over time directly correlates with lower, if they have a fixed mindset about their students, they're not gonna be able to do it they, they, for whatever reason, they're too busy, they don't have the background, they don't have the prerequisite skills, that those mindsets correlate with lower success rates and greater equity gaps. And I'm gonna post one of the links to one of my favorite studies, which is by Mary Murphy and her group um, that is, is part of this conversation. But I think also that there are many other studies in, in uh, this realm. So let me see if I'm coordinated enough to, to do that. I'm on a new computer, so I'm sort of awkward. Um, the other thing I want to say is that there were, um, I hope that worked. Um, there were also questions about, is that, are we talking about STEM calculus or are we talking about business calculus? And some of the data, and Terrence clarified this, which I appreciated, um, in some of the RP group research, they have not uh, distinguished between the two types of calculus. Um, and we know that they're very different. Uh, and Terrence talked about their future research plans there. Um, so I wanted to say that CAP is going to be doing a series of webinars and we will announce those probably in the next week with colleges that are starting to develop open access STEM Calculus One corrects. And they are, we're going to have three colleges presenting their approaches. And we are in conversation about with those colleges about offering some professional development this summer that might be virtual um, on design of the STEM Calculus One COREC. So I just want to encourage you that today we were trying to focus on business calc. Some of the research doesn't distinguish between the types of calculus but we have this impending deadline around the business calculus. So that's why we focused there. Um, so I am now going to see if, Seppi, since you're still here, do you wanna sort of help me scroll through the questions and see if we can identify other questions that we might want to answer or maybe Summer? Yeah could help us identify questions. I'm getting some direct messages, so I'm replying to them. Oh, you're replying directly? Okay, is there anything that you wanna sort of surface more broadly? For, uh, so we have four units for the applied calculus and then two units for the co-requisite support. The standalone applied calculus has two hours of the lab plus one hour for the co-requisite part. So we have three hours of the lab for that class. I also wanna thank Julie Von Bergen for answering so many questions in the chat <laughs> while we were busy. Um, the materials we're going to be sending you will have not only Seppi's uh, syllabus, which will, will explain some of the stuff she just did, right? So if, if you wanna look at how the uh, hours are divided and what the, um, uh, units are and all of that will be in the course outline and you'll be able to see the grading schema, et cetera. Um, I'm also seeing some equity concerns here um, being raised. Um, 
And again, I think that the concerns that are being raised here are not reflected in the statewide data. And there are colleges that we, well, for example, we know from PPIC that calculus one completion has grown since AB 705, and that's STEM calculus completion as well as uh, the applied calc. But we also know that the students who are completing that course is actually a larger volume of students and a, a more diverse group of students. So I feel that if you're having local experiences that run counter to what the state data is showing, I encourage you to reach out to us because I think there are colleges that are doing things and having great success that we can all learn from. And I want to, in my role as um, with CAP, help facilitate that kind of uh, professional development for the state. Okay, anything else you see, Seppi, that we should address? Oh, um, Jesus, the materials, I think I might have, they're not going to be sent to your email this time. We're going to post them under the publications page on the CAP website. So the folder connected to this webinar, the recording of the webinar will all be part um, linked to the webinar uh, under our publications link for our website. All right, do we see any? Thank you, Summer. So any tips for phrasing when I'm checking on the students? Uh, honestly, I don't use anything special, but I try to be very friendly that, hey, I'm just sending you a checking email to see uh, if you need any help, any extra time to work on the assignment. Oh, I saw that you missed this assignment. Maybe you want to meet with me, how's your schedule? And uh, I'm bugging them a lot. So I feel like they're getting used to me getting an email from me. Uh, nothing is special, but I try to be consistent. And I feel like after a while, they feel comf comfortable asking for help. At the beginning, I'm the one starting it. And then after a while, they're just easy. It's easy for them uh, to just send me a message and ask for help. That's actually something, Seppi, that I feel is something you and Michelle have in common is this flexibility. Um, that you are willing to accommodate students if they're having difficulty getting things done. In addition to, you both are really great about giving consistent feedback and timely feedback to students and allowing students to um, revise or discuss their work with you. So I think those are all things too that are in that realm of, what did you call it? Support that's not algebra. Beyond <laughs> um, algebra. Yeah, beyond algebra support. Uh, Julie? Sorry, I have to jump in because when we first had to go online due to COVID, you showed me how in emails to students, you put a smiley face. Oh, yeah. And I started doing this and it changed my interactions with students completely over email. And so it was the best, the best tip I got all of 2020 um, was from <laughs> Seppi, just put a smiley face in your emails to students and it, it conveys yeah. your care. Oh, thank you. So yeah, it is very basic, but always add that a smiley face at the end of your message. I My class is asynchronous or our classes, when it is asynchronous, you really don't see them. So it is hard for them to see if this person is actually friendly or not. But that a smiley face actually making it very friendly. And then they are starting sending me a smiley face too, which is nice to see that. Okay, I um, I don't know. I'm, I'm skimming through. I think we have hit most of these. I hope. Um, I want to we thank have you. A hand up, Myra. Oh, do we? Uh, uh, Christina. Oh, Christina. Okay. Uh, hi, I have a question. Um, at Mesa, we offer the business cap for only three units. So I would like to ask Seppi and uh, Michelle. How many hours total uh, for the business cow with the prerequisites in your school? Michelle, are you still here? No, Michelle had to had to okay. leave. I, here. I think that might be answered if you look at her syllabus. Um, but I think that they have a five unit um, business mm. cow. Course. I'm in the same district as Michelle. Yeah. It is five units. Five units. And, and then the for some time. And then one unit of um support. 
Correct. On that. Mm -hmm. and then, so it means six hours together per week. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. And then I think this, if, if we, Julia, am I right in saying that at Los Madonos, uh, if you were teaching face-to-face, -face, it would also be six hours of contact a week if you were taking the course with support? Yeah, that's still the same, right, Seppi? We didn't change the support course. Yes. No. We we did up our pre-calc support course this year with more lab hours because- We added um, to the- the, to the pre-calc, but not applied calc, is that right? Yes, we did, we did. We added one hour of lab in class lab to the uh, applied calc with support. With so, the support. It's, so does it make it seven hours? Yes. Okay, it used to be six, now it's seven. Yes. Yeah, that's a strategy I see colleges doing more and more where they take a lecture hour and turn it into lab hours. So it's the same units for students, but more contact, um, yeah. Um, David is asking questions about STEM calculus um, with the co-rec. Uh, David, that I know of quite a few colleges right now that are positioned to offer that in the fall. And then I know of a, a bunch more that are wanting to develop it, right, for the future. Um, positioned offered in the fall, I know of um, Citrus, Kuyamaka, Mount Sac, Chafee. Um, and I think there there might be two more. Um, I want to say Mendocino and San Diego Mesa, but I'm not positive. So anyway, we'll be doing more on STEM calculus um, in March and early April. And then, like I said, I'm hoping to have a series that we offer this summer. All right. Okay. Is are we? Have we, have we done enough? Okay, and there's one more question for you, uh, Seppi, about the lab portion of the course. Maybe you could answer that directly in the, uh, in the what chat. What is the lab portion of the course? So uh, the standalone part, so the applied calculus has two hours of lab, and then the support part has one hour of in-class lab, so three hours total. Mm -hmm. Our lab hours used to be lab by arrangement, uh, but now that two hours is attached to the class. So you can either have it with your class or if it is asynchronously, it is going to be asynchronous on Canvas. So uh, can I ask if I don't understand for our campus is just four hours business cal. That's it. So we don't have any lab portion. Like what do these students do during lab? So the way that we have the lab assign like lab hours, we used to have a math lab and the lab hours was lab by arrangement. So a student had to spend some hours in the lab. So the definition of lab hours was for a student to work on more in-depth question that they require like some sort of support. But now that it is in class, so that's the same idea, but they don't, they are not supposed to go to a math lab. So normally working on more in-depth question requiring like providing individual feedback. And um, so normally like a harder question, I would say, and then extra practice, just in time remediation type of question. If so all, in your class. Yeah, so altogether the students are in the, if that is an in-person class, the students are in the class for um, two sessions of three and a half hours. Is that how it is? Mm -hmm. I think, Julian, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think depends on the instructor. You can have that lab hours part of your class, attach it to your class, or you can run it asynchronously. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we should call it a day. I want to thank, uh, Michelle has left, but Seppi, I want to thank you again for joining us. And again, thanks to those who um, answered questions in the chat as we were going, because I am, I cannot double task at all. So I really appreciate you stepping up and uh, taking on that role. Um, all right. So stay tuned to next week, checking into the California Acceleration Project website under publications. You can share this webinar. You'll also have a link to the folder that has materials from CEPI 
and Michelle, and then keep um, an eye out for our future webinars where we will tackle the STEM Calc 1 with COREC topic. Thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoy Thank the rest you. of your day. Have a good, have a good rest of your day.